Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes for everyone to get in, and then we will get started here shortly. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Wright. I'm with the Farm Service Agency Outreach Office. And we're here today with Dr. Tamara Cushing. She's going to provide us some information, some very timely information on um, disasters and uh, forestry. And um, at the end of this, um, at the end of this webinar, we have an opportunity to have your questions answered. You can, during the um, presentation, you can put your questions, put your questions into the Q&A and we will answer those at the end. And after this presentation is over in about two weeks, we will have them, we'll have this presentation and the slides posted to farmers.gov slash taxes. And so with that little bit of housekeeping, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to dive today into tax considerations uh, for forests that are affected by natural disasters. So I'm going to bring that uh, PowerPoint up real quick for you. And so uh, I'm Tamara Cushing. I'm a faculty member here at the University of Florida. I specialize in taxation of um, forest and forest products. Um, all things kind of business related to forest landowners. Today, we're just going to really focus on the natural disaster uh, aspect of it and thinking about what that means. Uh, some of you may have experienced recent hurricanes, uh, was just reading about wildfires in Louisiana. And of course, we know we've had wildfires out west. Uh, those of you that might be in more northern regions of the country might be uh, thinking about the fact that you had some sort of uh, ice damage earlier in the year or know that that's an annual possibility for you. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So just as a quick introduction, I want to tell you that tax law is really complex. I'm sure that most of you are very aware of that, and that's probably why you're here in the first place. And so um, there's only so much that we can cover on this as far as details. And the details are often what really matters in some of these tax uh, situations. So I'm gonna give you kind of the high level information. And then I would highly advise you talk to a tax professional or reach out to someone with your specific information to try to determine how this would apply to you or if it does. Um, but also know that this information constantly changes um, every time the legislature is in session, uh, there's a potential that something that I've said will change. Uh, we've seen that in the not too distant past uh, and how casualty losses are being treated. So you'll see that reflected today. But that's not to say that sometime later in the year that we won't see a change in it. Uh, first and foremost, I want to tell you that this presentation today is not tax advice. This is meant to be educational in nature uh, and meant to help you if you're doing it yourself or if you're working with a tax professional. Recognizing that not all tax professionals see all kinds of situations. Sometimes they've not dealt with a casualty before. Sometimes they've not dealt with some, someone with forest land before. And so that uh, is something that's very different for them. So I wanna make sure you're kind of aware of that uh, from the beginning. But I am doing my best today to make it as clear as I can for you so that you can interpret your situation. All right, so just kind of a rundown of where we're gonna go in the next, let's say, hour. Um, we're gonna talk about casual loss, what it is, what it isn't, uh, how that interacts with this concept of basis that's kind of first and foremost something you need to know. We're gonna talk about games because sometimes when we have an event like a hurricane, or a tornado, we try to do some salvage off of it and sell uh, the timber off of it, and it might trigger a gain. And how can we deal with the gain and what does that look like? I'm gonna talk a little bit about financial assistance, um, maybe. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about reforestation because often what I like to see us focus on is um, looking forward. Uh, we've had this natural disaster event, 
Um, we're trying to get all our affairs in order uh, to, to move forward. And of course, we want to do that with the timber as well. And what provisions exist for us to move forward? All right. So let's start with some kind of definition on what casualty loss is. So a timber casualty loss, and we are going to focus on the timber today. We don't tend to have the loss on the land. It's more on the, the timber that's attached to it, right? A timber casualty loss is the damage, destruction, or loss of timber resulting from an identifiable event. Okay, so I want to be really clear on that identifiable event. We want to be able to say that something happened, and I should be able to look back and find evidence of exactly what happened. So I'll, I'm sitting here in Florida. Let me use a really clear example from what just happened. A couple of weeks ago, we had a hurricane come through Florida in the Big Bend region, and then it went into Georgia, and then on into South Carolina, and off, okay? So if, if I had a loss in that time period, uh, and I went to go claim that with the IRS, um, I would be able to go and print out from the weather um, reports that there was a hurricane that came ashore, and the path that hurricane took, um, you know, and, and be able to document it, right? So I want to be able to document that this happened. It's not this uh, nebulous, uh, we have a dry summer. We say things like that all the time. Um, what I'm looking for is to pinpoint it on when it happened. So I can pinpoint that that hurricane made landfall and they have a tracking of where it went to. That's all over the news. It's well documented. That's our identifiable event. Um, you can see it with a wildfire. We know when it was ignited within reason, like at least within the day, they know when things have been ignited and they've got um, usually calls to 911 to document these type of events to know when something has happened. Cool. All right, so there are three concepts that really go into defining when we have a casualty loss. The first is sudden, the next is unexpected, and the third is unusual. And it has to meet all three criteria in order to be considered a casualty loss. So I'm gonna take one by one, sudden. We're talking about something that happens very quickly, okay? So a hurricane comes in, a tornado comes through, snaps to timber, um, an ice storm happens overnight, right? These things happen very quickly. It is not, um, those trees have been dying over the course of the summer because we're having uh, an unusual heat wave. Um, we've had southern pine beetle or some kind of insect or disease that has been gradually killing the trees within that stand. That does not meet the sudden criteria. You'll see down on the bottom, fire, hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, and these are big storms like windstorm events, earthquakes, volcanic eruption. Uh, hopefully we don't have to talk about that anytime soon. It can be an auto crash, right? Somebody. Um, has an accident that goes into your stand of timber, uh, it starts a fire, right? That crash is what did it. It wasn't a wildfire per se, it was a, a fire ignited by an auto crash. And then, and of course, I will tell you that shipwrecks um, are, are included in that list, but we don't tend to have to worry about that. And then Southern Pine Beetle, that's at SPB. Uh, there's documentation, if that kill happens within nine days, that's a very rapid event doesn't usually happen quite like that. But if you were able to document that they came in and the first sign of death um, to, to um, the end of the stand life is within nine days, uh, then you would have that sudden criteria met. Unexpected. This means it's unintended, unintended or unanticipated. Now, I know some of you are gonna argue, well, wait a minute, we always anticipate hurricane. That's why it's called hurricane season, right? That hurricanes come and we know that every, um, from I think it's beginning of June uh, through November that it's hurricane season. So we anticipate having a hurricane, but we don't know where it's gonna happen. So it's not like we anticipated in that particular location to happen at a particular time. And it certainly doesn't meet, uh, it's not intended. And so the intended means if um, you were out there doing a prescribed burn that you lost control of, um, that prescribed burn was an intended event. The fire was intended. And so that's not, to me, going to meet the unexpected criteria. Then the unusual, this is not a typical day-to-day -day occurrence. Um, you know, having some uh, regular seedling mortality, that's typical uh, for us to see that. 
uh, to have usual levels of drought in the summer, that's expected. So those things don't meet unusual. So you kind of see the three criteria and how they're working. Again, you have to meet all three. If you can argue on one of those that it doesn't work, then you're not going to have the casualty loss. All right, so let's talk about what happens if it's not a casualty loss, because there are a couple other categories that we would want to put those events in, even if they don't meet kind of the casualty loss provisions. So on the left, you see this normal timber loss that that is not going to be deductible. This is your expected mortality. So I, you know, as a forester, we tell landowners uh, and I teach my students, you put more trees in the ground than you really need to have to some level because you expect a normal amount of seedling death, right? That first year as they're getting established, we lose seedlings. That's not considered casually lost. Normal insects have insect disease infestation, right? If I go out in the forest, I'm gonna find some evidence of insect or disease and it kills a tree or it might kill a small pocket of trees, that usually is not gonna rise to the level of a casualty loss. Uh, low rainfall in any particular year. Now there, there might be might be an argument if we had extreme drought and, and not even like the kind of droughts we've been seeing because the droughts have been getting a little bit worse each year. Uh, we're not seeing any evidence that that would be considered a casualty loss um, yet. But that is something that I would expect to see somebody test at some point in the future. I don't know that I would recommend that you test it, but somebody probably will. Uh, crowding, right, when there's too many stems. So sometimes uh, we'll plant trees. Like I said, we overplant just a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, Mother Nature is going to help and give us some what we call volunteers or extra seedlings they've seeded in. Um, that crowding is going to probably cause some mortality, some low level mortality. That's not going to qualify. Improper planting, that would be the crew comes in and they don't get the roots straight, so they J-root too much of that. Uh, poor management practices, none of that. That's all normal, okay? On the other side, we have these non-casualty timber losses that are deductible. So this will be the result of maybe an unusual or unexpected event, but it wasn't sudden. So this would be the severe drought, tree mortality that was due to a sudden pine beetle outbreak, but they're not rising to that level of sudden. And so we have some ways to deduct non-casualty timber losses. All right, so as we kind of go down through these levels, right, we've decided it's a timber casualty loss that met the sudden, unusual, and unexpected categories. I can identify the event. Now we need to think about how you are holding the timber to decide exactly how we're gonna handle this. And there are rules depending on how you're holding it. And so when I say this, I wanna differentiate between somebody who is holding timber as an investment or a business versus somebody who's holding it for more of a personal use. So an example, if I have purchased the timberland or if I've uh, gotten it through an inheritance, and my intention in holding that timber is to sell timber and to make a profit off of it, then I could be considered in an investment or a business category. The difference between investment and business is really just the frequency of operations. So if I have 20 acres and I expect to make a profit on those 20 acres, but I'm probably not cutting about every so many years, um, probably my only, uh, um, only activity out there is for me to walk out there and kind of look at it, make sure that the fire lines are okay, maybe. Um, that's that's gonna be probably more investment category. And if I was in the business, I probably, ha probably have a larger holding. Um, that may not be true depending on your area and the value of the timber, but I'm also doing things more frequently. I'm out there, um, think of it more like a business, right? I'm out there, it, it is a more significant part of what I do. Uh, I'm treating it like a business, um, and I have more frequent operations out there. That's going to rise to that level. Personal use means I have timber out there. Um, I may not really have any intention of cutting it, but I may go out there occasionally and cut some for firewood, or I cut it because I want to make my own kind of like log cabin on the property. Um, that would be where I would go for personal use. All right, so that distinction is going to matter as we go forward, as we talk about what the restrictions are. So if you're in that personal use, casualty loss category, 
um, they're kind of like the timber is going to be treated the same as kind of like your home, your household goods, your personal vehicle. All those things are not considered really casualty losses unless they're in a federally declared disaster area. So you'll hear this discussed. Uh, we heard this a couple of weeks ago in Florida. We actually sometimes hear this before it even happens. As that hurricane was coming towards Florida, the governor requests from the president for a, a federally declared disaster area. So you'll get that declaration uh, sometimes ahead of time, sometimes after. So usually with a wildfire, it comes afterwards. Same with any earthquake, uh, tornado type of issues. We'll get that disaster declaration and it's issued on a county by county basis. So you need evidence that your property is within the declaration area if you're claiming personal use casualty loss. Again, you are in it for a profit and you're not in it as a business, okay? If there is no declaration for your county, then you have no allowable casualty loss if you're holding it for personal use uh, only. If you are holding it for personal use and you're in a federally declared disaster area, you're going to do the calculation of the actual loss that I'm going to show you, and then you're going to subtract $100 right off the top, and then you're going to take 10% of your adjusted gross income and subtract that as well. So you're going to see you're allowed to deduct way less as a casualty loss than somebody who's holding it as an investment for a business. Hence why I want you to think about that distinction. In general, um, if you're holding timber in personal use, you're not getting a lot of deductions for anything anyway. Uh, and so that's kind of where this is kind of going hand in hand with that. So uh, we tell forest landowners that if you are trying to make a profit from it, then you need to be looking at it like a business, documenting what you're doing, showing uh, that you're trying to make money at it so that should you have a casualty loss, um, or try to deduct expenses you can show you in, as an investor or as a business. All right, so now that we know the category, you know that you're a little bit more restricted on personal use. Let's talk about how we determine the actual dollar amount, okay? And again, if you're personal use, you're gonna do this calculation and then do those subtractions. So a casualty loss is the lesser of the decrease in the fair market value of the timber block that was due to the event. So I'm gonna talk about that first, what that means. What I need to do is figure out what was the fair market value of my timber before the event and then subtract it after the event, right? And so what's, um, what is that decrease, right? So if you had um, mature timber and uh, the hurricane came in and it wiped it all out and it's not salvageable, uh, the fair market value decline is very, very large, okay? So it's the lesser of that number or your adjusted timber basis for that same area. So oftentimes what happens is we see landowners who planted the timber themselves many years ago and their basis is very, very low and it's much lower than that decline in fair market value they're gonna be limited to what they have in it, what their adjusted timber basis is. I'm gonna talk about basis in a minute, but I wanna point out this concept of a block. So when we're talking about determining these numbers, we need to look at the record keeping unit that we have for the timber. So if I had a very large property and I was keeping my, my accounting, my record keeping system, let's say at a stand level. So I have a stand of um, longleaf pine over here that's about 30 acres and I keep all my um, information related to that stand together and over in another stand and another record keeping unit, another file um, is my hardwood stand. Then the block is the stands that I kept. If you have a smaller holding, you may not have separated those things out. You may be keeping everything as one piece of record keeping, right? All the money you have spent is in one account. Uh, it, it just says, this is how much I spent um, on the property. Then that is your entire block. And so while only part of the block may have had damage, we're gonna do a decrease in fair market value for the entire block. 
hopefully that's clear. All right, so let's talk about basis because basis is kind of the underpinning of what you're allowed, right? If I go back a slide, this last line is the adjusted basis. And I told you that it's likely in a lot of cases that that's your limiting factor, that that is lower than that decrease in fair market value, right? So what is the basis? The basis is the measure of your investment in what we call a capital asset, something that can make money. So in our case, we're talking about what do you have in the timber? What did you pay for it? What was it worth when you got it? Um, that's going to be what makes up that basis. That number is super critical uh, for us today. We're talking about loss, but it also is critical when you sell timber. So you need to know what that number is, whether you're having a sale or trying to claim a, claim a loss. For a sale, it's going to reduce your taxable gain. For your loss, it's going to tell you what you're limited to. So we need to know this number. So where does this number come from in the first place? So basis is determined by how you actually acquire the property. So you see on the slide, I'm lumping a lot. I think about the way people acquire property in four different categories. You can purchase the property, you can inherit it from someone, you can receive it as a gift, or you can do any kind of exchange. Some of the exchanges are taxable, some of the exchanges are non-taxable. The way you acquire the property is gonna tell us the signal for how we calculate that basis number. Remember the basis is what do I have in it? What did it cost me to get it? What was it worth when I got it? That's determined by rules that are specific to the way you acquired it. So I'm gonna to today talk to you briefly about purchasing it and inheriting it as an example of thinking about how we got it and how that's gonna play into this calculation for casualty loss. I will say that the rules for this determination are not specific to timber. Uh, these rules are, if you went into an accountant or a tax preparer's office and said, I, I uh, inherited my timber, they know what that means as far as basis. Uh, what they don't necessarily know is how your timber looks and the words that we might use within forestry. That would be the only difference, but they can help you figure out the basis. So looking at purchase property first. So if I purchase property, my basis is the total amount I paid for it, right? So when I walk in and I offer somebody uh, the money to buy their property, it's the offer amount, it's any attorney fees that I pay. If I have to pay commissions to uh, my real estate broker who helped me find the property, um, maybe I uh, paid a forester to cruise the timber on the front end so I knew how much was out there in order to purchase it. And then of course, any sales taxes that are um, levied on that purchase, all of that is part of your basis, okay? And so that amount is going to sit in the basis account for the time you purchase it until the time that you actually have a sale event or some kind of exchange, transaction, loss event. Big thing for you to see on the bottom of the screen here, it does not get indexed. And all that means is if I buy this property and I buy it in 1990 at 1990 prices, so let's say land was going for $750 an acre back then, then that is what is attributed to my basis account is what I paid for it back in 1990, not what it's worth today. So you can imagine that this is, this is a pretty big difference here, uh, what your basis is. And you think about that casualty loss being limited to the decline in fair market value versus uh, the uh, adjusted basis. So my basis would be pretty low. The timber might have grown quite a bit over that time. And that decline in fair market value could be huge, much larger than uh, my adjusted basis. And the rules say you have to take the adjusted basis. Okay? So that's purchased property. If I were to inherit that property, um, at the time that I inherit it, the basis is equal to the fair market value. So I inherit it from my grandmother when she passes away. 
At that time, we're going to look at what is the property worth. So if my grandmother passes away in 2010, sorry, let's say 2012, grandma passes away and leaves me the property, at that time, we're going to calculate my basis. And it's equal to what the property was worth the day grandma died. So we can look at land values at that time and what the timber was worth. And hopefully there's some appraisal mechanism that's happening at the time of you inheriting the property, okay? And that should happen either formally or informally, okay? So again, it's at date of death that we're gonna look at that. Uh, there is also a couple of uh, exceptions to that rule. So if grandma died, and within the first six months after grandma dies, um, some part of her estate, let's say it's stock, it drops in value. So stock market completely crashes within six months of grandma passing away. That's going to have a significant effect maybe on my entire, on the entire estate value. And so um, the person, uh, the executor working through the estate can choose to have a different date to value everything in the estate. So they may decide that, you know, the stock market dropped um, three months after grandma died. So they will reevaluate everything at that three month point. And that is gonna be the basis point. That's that fair market value. It just happens to be on a different date. The other exception is for something called step up. Um, and so, I'm sorry, special use valuation. Um, special use valuation is, a mechanism that we can use with ag, ranch, and forest land to recognize the fact that fair market value um, for these lands, especially if they're near any urban areas, like on the outskirts, may not be reflective of the current use of it. So let me give you an example. If grandma owned land on the I-85 corridor outside of Atlanta, we know that those property values have continued to go up. Land values have gone up higher because of the potential for development. But what grandma was using it for was forest land. So what we can do is we can elect to value that land uh, for its current use and think about um, not taking it at complete fair market value. So there's a, a, an ability to do a reduced um, value at that date of death period. Uh, called special use. You would need to know that that had happened on the estate because that would be your basis that you would take in it. So all of this inheritance is just to say that, you know, no matter what grandma paid for it when she got it back in the 80s, when she died in 2012, it's coming up to the fair market value at that point in time, which results in a step up in basis for you. You need to know this because it's a different number than say if you purchased it. So understanding these different ways of acquiring property are gonna drive what your basis is as you think about uh, what your casualty loss is for the property. All right, so no matter how you acquired it, the wording on that previous slide about casualty losses was talking about uh, the timber, right? And so what I need to know is the basis in the timber and we're gonna to have to separate that out. So no matter how you got the property, you wanna have separated out the land from the merchantable timber, from pre-merchantable, from any buildings and put that in different accounts. And so that's gonna help you when it comes to time to sell it or you have a casualty loss, you know that the merchantable timber value was in your basis account was X and now you know what your uh, casualty loss limitation is gonna be. So some of you may be going, wait a minute, I have no idea what my basis is. I've never heard the word before. So I don't know what it is. So how do I get it if I didn't do it? Or I never allocated it out to just the timber. It was just a big basis account. So it's generally recognized that, you know, a lot of folks are walking around without this kind of separated out or without knowing what it is. And that we're going to allow them at the time that they need to, uh, take a loss or sell their timber and take the basis off of it to be able to backtrack and figure out what that number was. So we're gonna call this a retroactive basis determination. All we're gonna do is kind of back up and we say, you know, when I got it in 2000, uh, when I bought it in 1990, um, what were timber prices when I bought it? 
And um, what was the volume estimate that was out there? Well, I remember when I bought it in 1990, the trees were about yay tall, they were seedlings. Uh, they may not even have been planted. That's probably not worth uh, doing the calculations to back into it. I would probably uh, give that a zero basis on that because it's not uh, economically gonna pencil out for you to pay somebody to do that for you. Uh, if however, you got it five years ago and then the hurricane comes through, we wanna back up and figure out, you know, what do we think volumes look like back then? A forester can help you with that. They can back that out. Uh, timber prices, we have all kinds of reporting services uh, in certain states here in the South, we have Timber Mart South. Um, we also um, have extension offices within your state as well as uh, county foresters uh, that work for the state agency that collect that timber price data. You wanna go back to the time when you acquired it. Um, you're probably gonna need some help from a forester. Uh, if you need help from a forester, they're probably gonna charge you for it. So think about what the tax break uh, is gonna be for you for, for paying somebody to help you out if you haven't done this. All right, so the slide talking about the limitation for casualty losses specifically use the words adjusted basis. You are limited to the decline in fair market value or your adjusted basis, whichever was lower. So I just told you how to get the original basis, but then we're gonna adjust it. And we adjust it by taking out any, what we call depletion. Depletion is what happens when I sell timber, when I start recovering it. That's another um, webinar altogether. So come back in October, we'll do one on timber, uh, specifically talking about some of this. Uh, if you've taken any depreciation, that's not something we do in timber. If you've had any prior losses, that's going to adjust your basis. So you would take your original basis and subtract any losses that you claimed. Uh, if I had any capital improvement costs, uh, anything that I wasn't able to deduct, then that would be added in. And those things that get added in should only be added to timber if they're timber expenses that you could not deduct. Most of the capital improvements are land type of improvements. Okay, we'll take a quick check. Okay, we're still good on that. All right, so back to the actual deduction. Okay, so you're gonna figure out uh, what the decline in fair market value was. Uh, you're going to look at your adjusted basis, figure out whichever is lower. And if you're an investor or you're a business, that's going to be the amount that you use as your deduction. If you are personal use, you're going to then go ahead from there, subtract the $100 and the 10% of your adjusted gross income for that year. The deduction is usually taken in the year of your loss, um, but there are provisions to allow you to go back a year. And the reason they're doing that is because they recognize that you're, uh, and a lot of times you've had a massive loss Sometimes it's of other uh, household goods. They want to be able to let you match that to the year that's lost um, as soon as possible, right? So if I can go back, if I just had the hurricane, if I can go back and amend my 2022 tax return that I've already done and get that loss in there, that'll put some of that tax savings in use to help me recover sooner. So that provision does exist. If there are multiple owners on the property, then we need to allocate it by ownership. So if my brother and I are equal owners in the property, then we're gonna do a 50%, um, each of us would have a 50% on that loss deduction, okay? Calculated uh, for us, okay? Um, you're gonna need to be able to provide proof of ownership for starters, right? And I, just as an aside, um, if you have air property, if you don't have your name on the title, even if you're not in a casualty loss situation right now, please look at getting help to get that resolved. You need your name on the title. You need to be able to show proof of ownership of the timber. Um, and we see a lot of folks who have had the property passed down to them that don't have clear title this tends to happen in our African-American populations here in the South. If you don't have clear title, you can't show proof of ownership. You can't show a casualty loss. So you need to get that cleared up, whether you have a loss right now or not, I beg of you to go ahead and get that cleared up as soon as possible. Um, you need to be able to show proof of the actual loss. And you say, well, how do I do that? I can go out there and I can take pictures and show you the timber blown down or the timber that snapped in half. 
you need all of that. Hopefully you have some pictures of before. And I know that's the really hard part because I could sit here and say, do you have any pictures from before? And you're like, well, I didn't know I needed pictures because I didn't know I was gonna have a loss. So just periodically take pictures when you're out on your property. You know, show somebody how beautiful your property is. Take a picture every once in a while uh, and hold on to them. Just keep a file with the date, right? So you can, in the file for each of those digital images, it shows the date the photo's taken. So if I had been out on my property in, um, in the beginning of August here in Florida, and it shows that date, and I was out on some part of it, you can see the big, beautiful, long leaf pine trees, pole size, and then I can come back in the beginning of September and take a picture and show you the pole snapped in half, you've got a before and after to prove the loss, right? Uh, we're also gonna uh, have somebody put value to it for us to show what that actual decline in value is. And then I need to be able to show proof of the basis. How did I determine the basis um, and, and what were the adjustments that were made to it over time? I'm going to warn you, this could trigger a net operating loss for you, especially if you're in the business. This gets really complex really, really fast. If you are in a situation and think you have a net operating loss, if, if you're in the business and you know what I'm talking about, um, but don't know how to calculate it, this is a time where you get a tax preparer that you probably do not need to go about this by yourself. Uh, the rules for net operating losses are beyond what we can do here today. Um, there are there are probably other webinars and other guidance out there for you um, that you could follow. They're not necessarily timber specific, and that isn't necessarily that it's timber specific. But you know, I've now told you casualty loss rules that are timber specific, and you're trying to integrate that with net operating. Get somebody to help you, um, preferably somebody that can help you that has some knowledge of timber, uh, and you're not the first return they've done in timber. Uh, they can learn, for sure. Um, so if you have uh, any salvage, if you decide to go about salvaging some of the timber, you uh, you know, maybe it's not poles or saw timber grade anymore, but you can get some pulpwood for it um, and you feel like it's worth it, um, go ahead and we're going to take that out first. So we're going to handle that as well. And we're going to handle any insurance proceeds. Not many people have insurance on their timber, uh, but should you have it, we're going to need to acknowledge that we have insurance proceeds coming in. All right, so how do we report all this? So I told you how to calculate it all. Now we got to get to the point where we're actually reporting this um, in the um, on tax forms, right? So you're going to report the casualty loss on form 4684. Uh, and that is a very specific form for casualty losses. Then it's going to depend, again, how are you holding the timber? Are you a business owner? Business owners, you're going to do 4797. If you're an investor, you're going to file on Form 1040 on Schedule A, and it's going to go under other itemized deductions. If you're a personal use, you're also going to use Form 1040 Schedule A. Okay, So each one of you is going to have a different place that this is going to go. So you really have to know whether you're in the business. Again, that's on frequency of activity. Uh, you should be having timber sales a little bit more frequently. Um, and you should be treating it like a business, meaning I expect to see a record keeping system, documenting your time, documenting the dollars, treat it just like you would if you owned the coffee shop down the street. Investors, um, you should also probably have documentation that you're treating it uh, in a profit seeking manner, um, but they're not expecting to see the same level of activity. You may not be doing a lot of the stuff yourself, having a lot of help on the side. And of course, personal use, you're using the wood. All right, so let's talk insurance for a minute. I, I don't expect that a lot of you have uh, insurance on the timber. It's not very common uh, because it's expensive to have it. Um, and then, you know, for the um, freak occurrence that you need it, uh, you might wish you had it uh, if it happens to you, but um, for most folks, it's just not economically penciling out. Um, if you expect that you're going to be reimbursed for part or all of your loss, so you have insurance, you think you're gonna get the money for it, so track the expected reimbursement when you calculate your loss. So do all the loss calculation and subtract off what you expect to receive. Um, you have to reduce your loss even if the payment's not coming until 
next year or the year after. The later we get into the tax year, uh, the more likely that payment is to be coming in another tax year. You still want to reduce it uh, to recognize the fact that you expect to have receiving it. If you get it later, right? So you did that, you took it off this tax year, and then later you get the um, the amount, and it's not uh, what you thought it was going to be. It's more or it's less. Then you're going to correct it on the next tax return. If you get the, the reimbursement or the insurance uh, prior to doing the loss calculation, go ahead and just subtract the actual reimbursement when you figure your loss. So no matter what, if you have insurance, you should be taking that amount off. If you don't know if you're gonna get compensated, um, if you're questioning that you're gonna get any money at all for it, then I would default and say that you're not. All right, so for some of you, you're gonna be able to salvage. Um, salvage is just a way of saying that we're gonna go ahead and try to make lemonade out of lemons, right? Um, you know, here in the South, if it's been a tornado or a hurricane and you were growing um, chip and saw, saw timber, poles, um, maybe up North it's veneer quality stuff and the storm has damaged it to the point where it's gonna be pulpwood, right? So you're gonna salvage it anyway, try to make the best out of it. If you get salvage income, you're gonna be able to call that transaction, assuming it's a casualty, we're gonna call it an involuntary conversion, right? You did not mean to have that income come at that time, right? So uh, we're gonna go ahead and call it an involuntary conversion. And this is gonna be when the salvage income is greater than your adjusted timber basis. Again, now you know why I spent time explaining where basis comes from because your, if your income from the salvage is greater than the basis, you're gonna have some kind of a gain, okay? And you're like, well, wait a minute, I should not have had that gain. I wasn't planning on that gain. The gain's not what I wanted it to be either to make it worse. You can pay, you can choose, pay the tax on the gain, or you can do this involuntary conversion, defer the gain by purchasing qualified replacement property. So, that may or may not be in the cards for some of you, right? Because a replacement property may cost more than you have from the gain. You might not have enough income to go buy replacement property. So let me tell you what replacement property looks like so you can see that that definition is a little bit wider than maybe you're thinking right now. So qualifying replacement property, it needs to be kind of a like kind of property, right? So if I had that hurricane, tornado, wildfire that comes through, damages my timber, I do a salvage, I get a gain, now I wanna go ahead and do reforestation. So the replacement property can be my reforestation expenses. The fact that I replaced it with a new stand of timber, that I'm putting trees back in the ground. So I can defer my gain by saying I put it into reforestation. And as long as you still own that that replacement property, the gain is deferred. I can instead, if I got a big gain, I can go buy replacement timberland. That does not mean I let go of my current land. The timber's gone, take the gain from the timber, and I go buy another property. Now, I heard something really interesting out west. Some of the companies uh, did this involuntary conversion. They um, had lost a lot of the timber that they had not anticipated. They had multiple age classes and were now facing kind of gaps in their age classes. So they went out and they took that gain and they looked for property that had timber on it that was the same age as what they had lost. So they lost 15 year old timber. Uh, so they went and found 15 year old timber on some property somewhere else. And they bought that as replacement timberland, okay? So they rolled the gain over into replacement timberland that actually filled the gap for what they had lost. So that's a strategy that you could use to defer the gain. Uh, you could do reforestation on that replacement property. So I buy a piece of land and pay for reforestation on it. So it does not have to have current timber on it. You can buy land and reforest it and that would qualify as replacement property. The other thing you can do if you're deciding that this is getting risky for you, um, is you can buy controlling stock in a timber corporation, um, but it has to be at a controlling level. So you have to have enough of it in order for this to kind of work. You have to buy this replacement property within two years 
for you to be able to defer the game, okay? There are other rules around this. So if you think about doing this, uh, again, talk to a um, talk to an accountant or a tax preparer about some of the rules around this to make sure that you're staying within uh, the guidance on what's acceptable and what's not. All right, so you have um, had a loss on the property. We've talked about uh, how to actually uh, document that loss and then what the amount of the loss is gonna be but you have some expenses related to uh, dealing with this loss. So we're gonna deduct the cost of determining casualty or theft, right? So, and I say theft because sometimes that's included as well. Theft is not casualty, I do wanna be clear. But what we can do is we can talk about the appraisal, right? So if I'm gonna look at before and after, I need to know what was the, what's the current value and what was the value before. So maybe I pay for an appraisal. Maybe I pay for somebody to come out and cruise it to be able to tell me what's out there and can I salvage it. Um, I pay a photographer because I don't have the skills to do it myself. You don't need to do that. Use your, many of you will probably have some kind of smartphone. Uh, if you don't, you have a family member with a smartphone. They don't have to be fantastic photos. You just need photo evidence. Uh, and then kind of any incidental costs. These are gonna be operating expenses. So if you're holding it as an investment, you're gonna capitalize those expenses. You do not have the ability to deduct operating expenses right now because that would have gone under miscellaneous itemized deductions and those are currently suspended. So again, any expenses used to determine the casualty loss uh, are gonna be considered operating expenses. You're gonna to have to capitalize those if you're an investor. If you're in a trader business, you're gonna use form 1040 and they're gonna go on schedule C or F depending on how you typically file. Personal use, you don't get to do that. All right, so previously, in, in one of the previous um, hurricane events, um, we had some money come from the federal government to compensate forest landowners for some of the loss that they incurred. So specifically, the one I'm aware of was Hurricane Michael, which I believe happened in 2018. Um, hit a lot of the Southern states. Um, the federal government set up these kind of block grants. Um, sometimes it's other types of uh, compensation that's coming through um, our federal agencies or even state agencies. And so that money went to each of these states and they were done for different purposes. And so specifically thinking about Hurricane Michael, if you got the money that block grant, and it was passed to you, and the intent of the money was for cleanup of your property. That money for cleanup is to be treated as ordinary income, okay? Because it's not actually paying for timber, it's just paying for your expenses. So we're gonna treat that as ordinary income. You have to claim it as ordinary income, and then you take the expenses off just like we talked about previously, okay? In Florida, my understanding is those block grants were compensation for loss. So they went to forest landowners, recognizing that they lost the value of their timber and they were being compensated for the loss of their timber, not to clean up the property. And so at that point, it, again, it's still considered income to the taxpayer, okay? But think of it now as a trade, right? Uh, you may or may not be able to salvage that timber out there, but they are giving you income for the timber, okay? So now what we need to think about is how is that income going to be taxed when I'm getting compensated for my loss? It depends. And what it depends on is whether the way you were holding the timber, whether the timber was going to be ordinary income or capital gains income. So depending on your eligibility for ordinary or capital gains income, that's gonna determine whether that loss compensation grant is ordinary or capital gains income, okay? So we need to think about that if you've held it, and we'll talk about the qualifying for capital gains in just a moment. So getting this loss compensation grant may actually result in a gain or it depends on a law, it can be a loss depending on your basis. So back to, rolling all these calculations together. And again, you can take that loss compensation by replacement property and defer the gain in that involuntary conversion. Again, now you're seeing 
all these topics start to wrap up again, even though this is a payment from somebody else. All right, so quickly, I wanna break down what the types of income are. Uh, a, in case you decide to sell, salvage some of that timber, or if you get that block grant uh, loss compensation, you need to understand what the underlying asset was. So we had two types of income, right? Ordinary income, that's what the, the higher rate brackets uh, that you see with your wages, um, and then capital gains. Capital gains enjoy lower rates. The current rate structures are zero, 15, and 20%. You don't pay self-employment tax on capital gains income, uh, and you can completely offset capital gains income with any capital losses, okay? So if you had capital losses from other uh, holdings that you have, and then you have capital gains from your timber, they can offset each other, okay? I tell you this so you understand how we're gonna look at this timber income. So for timber, we're thinking about how long have you held the timber, right? So you wanna hold the timber for more than a year. That sounds great unless that hurricane comes in and you didn't have any control at all. But if you held it for more than a year before the event, then most likely you're gonna be able to call it capital gains. That's gonna go for anybody who holds it in a profit-seeking way, so your investors. And um, if you're in the business, if you hold it and you sell it as standing timber, we're gonna be able to tax it as capital gains income. Okay? If you get it as a gift, um, and let's say I got it as a gift from my best friend um, back in uh, July of this year. So I had it a month before the hurricane came, but my friend had had it for like three years before. Then it's gonna meet that threshold because we're gonna add the time together of those two people. And as long as it crosses that year threshold, it would be eligible for capital gains treatment. If you inherit it, so um, grandma died earlier this year uh, and she had bought the property back in the 90s, then you're gonna be assumed to have met that holding period because it, there's no holding period requirement when you inherit it. So all that's gonna say whether you can get capital gains treatment on any timber sale on the salvage, or if you get that lot grant compensation as a, a compensation for loss. All right, so if you have that uh, happen where you're doing a salvage sale, you're gonna recover your timber basis, right? That was kind of why we set all that up, done through some depletion processing. Um, it's just the adjusted basis divided by the total volume of the timber. Um, and then proportionally, you're multiplying that out by how much timber you sold, right? So I have a total amount in that block of basis, uh, how much timber I had total, it will give me a per unit. So, so much per ton, so much per uh, thousand board feet. And then I go and I sell some of it because I um, had that hurricane come through. I sell, salvage sold some of it. I'm going to claim some of that basis back to offset the gain. We would do that for every single account. Okay. We'll talk more about that in October if you're really interested. Come back for more. So, I wanna look forward from here for the rest of this time I have with you uh, in the reforestation. So you've had a loss, you've cleared the land, you've salvaged it, um, whatever you had to do. We're gonna think about reforestation now, right? So we're gonna put trees back on the ground. We're gonna think about any of the site preparation, the stuff it takes to, to get the stumps out of there. Um, maybe you know in Florida, some folks are gonna do some bedding, seed seedlings that are purchased, brush and weed control labor for putting trees in the ground, but not your own labor. All of that is what I'm gonna call reforestation expenditures. There is a tax provision that allows us to take an outright deduction of reforestation related expenses up to $10,000 per tax year. So I had Hurricane Michael in 2018, got everything cleaned up, I'm ready to put trees in the ground in 2022. I could put trees in the ground. If I spent $9,000, I could outright deduct $9,000 worth of reforestation related expenses. That's per qualified timber property uh, per tax year. If I had spent uh, $12,000 on reforestation in that tax year, I would deduct the 10 and anything above that, that extra $2,000 I spent, I would start writing off over the next eight years. 
okay? A little bit each year. It's kind of like a depreciation, but it's, um, it's equally spread out over eight tax years. So just a quick example, you spend 25 on reforestation expenditures in 23. You're gonna deduct the $10,000 on that 23 return. The rest of it, that $15,000, I'm gonna hold in an account. And each year I'm gonna deduct some part of that, okay? Starting with the current year. So I would deduct 1 14th in that current year. And then in the next few tax years, I'm gonna do 1 7th. And at the end, I'm gonna take what's left. Next year, if I need to do more reforestation on it or more expenditures on the same property, I can have another up to $10,000 deduction on new activities that happen in 2024. There are uh, these provisions called recapture for the amortization. So anything that went over the 10, if I start writing that off and then I sell the timber two years into it, I'm going to have to pay an extra tax and some penalties for on the gain that I got from disposing of that, selling it to somebody else. That only counts in that first 10 years. All right, so, so thinking a little bit of strategy on the reforestation. So we had a hurricane. You start site prepping this year, right, in 2023. We do this, right? We do this all the time. We do some cleanup. We do site prep in the fall. We get into the spring or, or late winter, there are January, February, March, depending on where you are in this country, we start putting trees in the ground. Those things are occurring on two different tax years. And so because the incentive is available every tax year right now, you can take advantage of staggering those operations in a two different tax years. And you have up to $10,000 in the one tax year, up to $10,000 in the other tax year, and then anything that goes above in each of those years, you would just create that account to start amateurizing off the rest of it, okay? So we're just taking advantage of the typical uh, way we stagger our operations anyway. So a couple of quick notes on this because I want you to make sure you hear it. You have to do this in the year that you, uh, that you take the reforestation. So if I put trees in the ground in 2023, then when I file in April, that I have to take it on that tax return. You cannot do it on an amended tax return. So if I find out a year later, in April of 2024, I find out I could have done that, it's too late, it's gone, it's gonna be your basis in that stand of timber, okay? So you need to do it on a timely filed return. If you got any cost share help um, from the government to do reforestation, you have to include the cost share dollars in your income in order to then take the reforestation expenses off, okay? We'll talk more about that in October if you're really interested in hearing more about cost share. If you don't use it all, if I only spend $9,000 on reforestation, the extra $1,000, I can't carry that over for next year. It doesn't work that way. And then of course, I told you about recapture. That's bad, bad. That happens if you sell before 10 years. So to do this, if you're an investor, again, you're, you're trying to make a profit on it, you're gonna take this reforestation incentive, section 194, on schedule one of your 1040. If you're a business, it's on schedule C or F, you're still gonna file form 4562 depreciation amortization to write off the yearly expenditures. Again, you cannot do this on an amended return. It is one of the worst mistakes I see happen uh, oftentimes tax preparers are not aware of these provisions, so they do not tell forest landowners that this is an option. They wind up filing the tax return. Uh, and then of course I meet that taxpayer a couple years later and I have to tell them, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do about it. So I want you to file this away, hear that this is an option for you. And in the year that you put trees in the ground, you either need to look me back up, find this PowerPoint, find something on reforestation and take it to the tax preparer or when you do your own, re own return. Uh, I just, as I kind of wrap up here today, I want you to hear that there is some casualty loss legislation. You know, one of the things that happens, right, is that landowners are hold that timber. It's gaining a lot of value over time. And what we're limited to is what we paid for it. 
Um, we don't have a lot of insurance. There's not subsidy programs. There's very little help when we have these disasters to compensate for the fact that a landowner might have been growing those trees for decades. And so that increase in value, they were maybe that was their retirement fund, uh, a grandchild's college fund. Um, all of that is wrapped up in it, and yet it's lost. Uh, happens very rapidly, and there's no way to make up for it because what uh, the costs that were in that basis account are so low um, because they're not indexed for inflation. So it has been introduced uh, in Congress, this Disaster Reforestation Act. And what it would do was really recognize that um, fact that we've had these uh, decades of gain uh, being captured in the timber, but then it's lost instantaneously. What it's meant to do is to help um, bring up that value um, so that you can deduct more of what you actually have lost in the form of the timber that's gone. It's been proposed, uh, last I saw earlier this year, it's in the Senate Finance Committee. It does have bipartisan support, but if you have opportunities to talk to your uh, senator or uh, your congressman, make sure they're hearing from you. This is federal legislation that's being proposed, um, but they need to hear from you and what a difference this would make for you. If you can say, this is what my loss will be limited to and show it to them, uh, take them out on your property when they're home, let them see the very real loss that you've incurred, that could all go a long way to help you. It would give you an improved deduction, but right now you're, you're limited. So if that speaks to you and you think this would be to your benefit, this is uh, what uh, certain groups are advocating for. Stay tuned, hopefully we'll have uh, more news in a future session. So quick end notes, please keep excellent records to substantiate anything that you've done, what's happened out there. Uh, you wanna show A, that you're either in the business or an investor, um, but also documentation of um, what your basis is and what was out there before this event happened. Uh, at the end of this, you're gonna have to make some decisions, whether you salvage, you don't salvage, whether you stay in forestry or you don't, but make them, thinking about your objectives, uh, consider the biology of what's going on out there, uh, whether you need to, to make some, um, some harvest to help what's left do better. Uh, think about the financial implications and legal factors if there are multiple owners. This, is a, this can be really complicated. Um, I'd advise you to find some, some good help uh, if you're in this situation, but recognize that not everybody is uh, versed on this because it's not happening to everybody all the time. And a plan for what you can plan, right? Make sure you have some records ahead of time so that if you're in this boat, you can show what you've been doing. So quick resources for you, the Forest Landowner's Guide to the Federal Income Tax. This is Ag Handbook 731. The current edition is out online. You can uh, Google it and find it. Uh, the edition is from 2012 or 13. We're currently working on revising it and updating it. But until then, um, most of the information in there is solid. Of course, uh, the, the limitation on federal uh, disaster declarations for personal casualty losses, that is new. So please hear that if that pertains to you. I'd also refer you to the Hardwood Timber Industry Audit Technique Guide. This is a guide produced by the IRS. Uh, once upon a time when it was uh, produced, I reviewed it. Uh, it says hardwood, but it, it holds up for pines as well, um, but uh, pines and, sorry, softwoods in general, dug for whatever your species. It really is meant to help an auditor who's coming out to look at your property if you're uh, selected for an audit. So it kind of tells them about the industry in general and, and how you might be holding your books and things. There's also a timber casual loss audit technique guide. Highly recommend taking a peek at that if you enter those words in your, your search bar, you should be able to pull these up online. And then finally, this Woodland Steward Forestry Tax Series uh, I did with a, a few other folks in the beginning of 2022. They were about an hour long each. Uh, they, they were focused on timber. There was one specifically on casualty losses, um, but you can go to these webinars. They're free for you to access. They were all recorded and should be a, a good source of information for you. So with that, I have time. If we got any questions that came in, I want you to see 
Um, the uh, my email address if you have questions, if your uh, tax preparer uh, needs to get some further clarifying information, happy to talk to them. Uh, hopefully, I can kind of bridge some of the language gap that happens between you and your tax preparer uh, if needed. So, uh, with that, I'm going to leave the slide up for just a second. The one question I see says Schedule E. I'm not really sure um, what that question pertains to. So, I would need a little bit more information to kind of know what you're asking on Schedule E if you have a chance. Oh, supplemental rental. Yeah, I would need to kind of understand what that question might be a little bit more specifically. Is there a minimum of woodlot size to qualify? Um, thank you for that question. Um, so for casualty losses, no. Um, if we start talking about reforestation, there are some. Um, some limitations on that in particular, um, but not necessarily on the casualty loss. Now, where it can come into play, though, on that minimum size is trying to justify that you're actually either in the business or an investor, right? And so to, you use the word woodlot. That kind of tells me that maybe you're up in the Northeast. Uh, certainly in the Northeast, you could have smaller acreages and have much more valuable stuff going on out there and more activities than I would have here in the South, right? In the South, five acres of a pine plantation, um, it would really be hard to show I was profit seeking on that small of an acreage. Um, if I had valuable hardwoods, uh, it might be a little bit easier to show profit seeking and the amount of activity. So that's a long winded way of saying it depends. So, uh, uh, on the Schedule E question, if you'll send me a more detailed question to my email, I'd be happy to try to answer that and, and kind of troubleshoot that question with you on Schedule E and the rental property tax uh, deduction question you're having. So I'll wait on here for a couple minutes, see if we have any other questions that pop up. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much for your attention today. I, I hope this was helpful. I hope that you don't need this information this year, that this is something you're looking for in case it happens to you. Um, otherwise, if I can be of any assistance, you know, I'm in Florida where this is a, probably a, an annual problem for us, and I'm more than happy to answer questions for you. I'm a public servant, and so I'm here to help you as much as I can. Thank you so much, Tamara, and thank you for this timely information right now. I'm going to do a couple of, give a couple of um, closeout comments. And if anybody has any further questions, go ahead and drop them in while I'm doing this. So in the chat box, I dropped some links. And um, I just want to explain that USDA has partnered with these great professionals here that um, are willing to come on once a month and give us an hour, hour and a half to just talk to us about different um, tax issues that affect um, agricultural producers and agricultural lands. And um, two of our partners that I dropped in the chat is Rural Tax, and their email is there, and um, they have resources there. Another of our partners is at Ag FTAP, and they have um, resources, and they also have um, events that you can attend online. And um, USDA, even though we do not provide tax information, we do have resources from our partners and those can be found at farmers.gov slash taxes. And so hopefully from there, you will be able to find uh, resources to help. We have these events, these webinars every month and they are on different topics and you can find the ones that have already been done on farmers.gov slash taxes. Um, as I'm looking, it doesn't look like there are any more um, questions in the Q&A. Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And I do want to, um, I do want to um, let you know that this has been recorded. And so everyone who registered will receive an email with the slides. And when the recording is done and posted to farmers.gov slash taxes, in two to four weeks, you will receive a follow-up link um, to let you know where that is. 
And so um, you will get the uh, resources from um, today's, uh, from today's uh, webinar. Um, I think that is it. That was the last question that did pop up in there. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. And as Tamara mentioned, she'll be back next month on um, another series of Timber Tax. So please join us there. For um, with Emails will be going out in Gov Delivery and we'll be on that website, farmers.gov slash taxes for registration. You guys have a good day and thank you for joining us.